1990s were Michael Jordan's decade in the NBA. While he was winning six titles with the Bulls, 29 other organizations missed out on championship glory. These are the stories of some of the teams that were relegated to footnotes on MJ's path to the top. Let's talk about the Indiana Pacers. The NBA team in the middle of college basketball is better country. The Pacers won three championships in the ABA and were one of four teams from the league to join the NBA after the two leagues merged in 1976. It took 19 years before Indiana became a 50-win team in the NBA with just two playoff series wins in that time. There weren't many wins, but there were names you'd remember, like Adrian Dantley, before he became an All-Star, and Alex English, before he became an All-Star, and George McGinnis, after he was an All-Star, and Chuck Person, who wore this to the draft. They were also once coached by a man named Dick Versace. Not Versace, Versace. And everything about that man was hilarious. In 1987, the local fans wanted the Pacers to draft beloved Indiana Hoosier Steve Alford with the 11th pick in the draft. Never mind that Alford wouldn't actually be selected until the middle of the second round. They wanted their guy. Instead, they got Reggie Miller out of UCLA. There wasn't booing at the draft, and if there was at home, they wouldn't boo for long. In his 18th season career, Miller became the best player in franchise history. He was the NBA's first three-point assassin, making 200 more threes in his first 10 years than any other player in the league. Miller made five all-star teams in Indiana and developed a legacy as one of the great clutch players of his day. In 1988, with the second pick in the draft, the Pacers got Rick Smith, refusing to let their unsuccessful selection of Steve Stepanovich with the number two pick in 1983 scare them off. A 7'4 Dutchman, Smith played college ball at Maris and became a good scoring center, averaging double figures in each of his 12 NBA seasons. In the mid-90s, the Pacers roster began to fill out. They drafted Dale Davis in 91 and the unrelated but similar Antonio Davis joined the roster in 93. Also in 93, they acquired Derek McKee in a trade for Detlef Shrimp and he became an all-defensive team player in Indiana. Their floor general came in 94 when Mark Jackson came over from the Clippers. Indiana pushes it back up court. Oh, what a pass by Jackson oh, to Dale. I'm surprised Dale even knew where it was. And in 96, Jalen Rose, hard to recognize without that impeccable hairline, joined the team after a trade with Denver. It was a steady build from general manager Donnie Walsh, but he turned one of the worst teams in the NBA into one of the best. In 93, Larry Brown left the Clippers, whom he made kind of decent in his season and a half there, to take over the Pacers. Up to that point in his career as a head coach, Brown won everywhere he coached and he coached everywhere. Carolina, Denver, UCLA, New Jersey, Kansas, San Antonio, Los Angeles, and then Indiana. Before he went to Philadelphia, Detroit, New York, Charlotte, SMU, and something called Auxilium Torino. Brown coached the Pacers four seasons. On his watch, the Pacers made the playoffs three times, won their first playoff series ever, and made the Eastern Conference Finals twice. But of course, he quit in 97, and the Pacers replaced the coach who was at the center of everything with a guy who thought coaches didn't matter, Larry Bird. We can skip the introduction. He's Larry Bird. He'd never coached a game before taking over the Pacers. He got the job because, duh, he was local legend Larry Bird. The Pacers were great when Bird was in charge. In three seasons, Bird's record was 147-67, and 67, and Indiana made the 2000 NBA Finals. That was probably the franchise's besides drafting me. Best move and he swears coaches don't matter. Things really got started for the Pacers in 93-94. In the regular season, the Pacers were a ho-hum 47 and 35. In the first round of the postseason, Indiana swept the upstart Shaq and Pity Magic. Then, aided by Atlanta's ridiculous decision to trade Dominique Wilkins, bounced the Hawks in the conference semifinals before losing to the Knicks in seven games in the East Finals. It was on and popping from there. Indiana won 50 games for the first time the following season and went to the East Finals, beating the Knicks along the way. After missing the playoffs in 97, Brown left, Bird arrived, and the Pacers made three straight East Finals, culminating in a trip to the 2000 NBA Finals. Those three seasons, Indiana was third in the NBA in winning percentage and fourth in point differential, leading the East in both all three years. So this series is a lot of 90s nostalgia, and I'm not sure what was more 90s NBA than Dale and Antonio Davis. They were there to be big and strong in a big, strong league, and that's what they did. They allowed Indiana to body up with the Knicks when a guy like Smits couldn't, and fans love pretending two guys with the same last name are brothers, especially when they aren't. The six years they played together, the Pacers were top six in points allowed, field goal percentage allowed, and three-point field goal percentage allowed. There was McKee, the consummate glue guy NBA fans loved to fawn over to show they were, in fact, NBA fans. 
You knew who he was if you were serious about the league, but only then. Bucket here, steal there, and well-timed passes made him top three on the Pacers in points, assists, and steals his first four seasons there. And there's Jalen Rose. For you kids who only know Jalen from working at ESPN, he was a huge college star and became a 20-point-per-game scorer in Indiana. He was cool, and at 6'8 and skilled enough to be a college point guard, his game was smooth and made everything look easy. So I didn't really hate Reggie Miller, but I kind of think he'd prefer if I did. Miller came into the NBA as the first player in league history who may not have been as good as his sister, and he heard about it all the time. I was first known as Cheryl Miller's brother, and I have had to overcome that, but I think now people are about ready to see who the real Reggie Miller is. Maybe that's what turned him into a classic antagonist, the man who relished squaring off against Michael Jordan like no one else did. He invited the boos with his flailing and flopping and silenced just as many with his jumper. He was one of the defining personalities of 90s NBA, and in a way, that would be impossible if we all loved him. There's also Mark Jackson, for reasons that aren't really personal. Jackson was the face of something so aesthetically unpleasant, the NBA changed the rules to eradicate it. Just standing there dribbling with your back to the defender. I hated that, man. The rest of the Pacers are pretty cool, though. Yes, Indiana lost to the Knicks in seven games in the 94 Conference Finals, but that's when Reggie Miller became Reggie Miller. With Michael Jordan playing baseball, there was an opening for the best visiting star at Madison Square Garden. Then in Game 5, with the Pacers down 12 going into the fourth quarter, Miller caught fire. He scored 25 in the final stanza, led the Pacers to a seven-point victory, and did this to Spike Lee in New York City. There's also this fight between Jordan and Miller that I wish we could forget, but here it is. Oh, and Reggie Miller came over and smacked All right, Michael, okay, yeah. and MJ is upset yeah. about it, and I can't blame him. Yes, sir, he ran right into him, and we got a brouhaha here. And a fun fact. Including postseason, the only players to score more points than Miller between MJ's first retirement and the end of the 95 season were Hall of Fame centers. During the Bulls' first five title runs, they didn't face the Pacers in the postseason. In the regular season during that time, the Pacers were 7-24 against Chicago with 226 winning percentage. Against the rest of the league in that span, the Pacers had a 561 winning percentage. In 98, things were different. The Bulls and Pacers split their regular season games. Indiana had its best team ever. 58 wins were the best in franchise history, and they were top five in offensive and defensive efficiency, and finally they got their chance at Jordan in the Eastern Conference Finals. For six games, the home team held serve. Five games within single digits. In game seven, the Bulls led most of the second and third quarters before Indiana took a 72-69 lead on a Smiths and one with 8.54 left. It was nip and tuck from there, but Chicago retook the lead with 4.45 left at 81.79. The lead never got bigger than five, but the Pacers never took it back. The Bulls survived their toughest postseason challenge of the 90s. And while Reggie loved the challenge of facing Jordan, he wasn't really up to it. Through the Bulls' run, when facing the Pacers, Jordan outscored Reggie Miller by double figures 29 times in their 49 matchups. Mike's 49 clutch time points in 98 against the Pacers were more than he had against any other team that season, including postseason. The Pacers certainly had their chances. In 94, they were one win away from the NBA Finals with a chance to put the Knicks away at home, but lost Game 6. Then, the Pacers took a four-point lead into the fourth quarter at Game 7 at MSG, but let those Knicks score 27 in the final stands, and New York was headed to the Finals. Then in 95, after toppling the Knicks, the Pacers had a rematch with the Magic, whom they defeated in the first round the year before. The first five games of the series had margins within five points with the home team winning each game. The Pacers then blew the Magic out in Game 6, setting up Game 7 to go to the NBA Finals. The Pacers were beaten by 24. But then, Mike left again in 98 and the Pacers were still there. In the 99 lockout season, Indiana made it back to the East Finals and faced the Knicks team that looked totally different than the one they saw in 95. The 8 seed Knicks were led by Latrell Sprewell, a year and change removed from that whole choking his coach thing, and Allen Houston. Once again, the Pacers-Knicks series ended at Madison Square Garden, this time with the Pacers on the losing end to Game 6. Oh, and don't forget about that four-point play. Inside of 10 seconds to go. Antonio is there. Johnson fires. Foul did it! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He it was fouled foul and he hit it! In 99-2000, led by Miller and Rose, the Pacers had the best record in the East during the regular season. For the second year in a row, they led the league in offensive efficiency. After winning their first two playoff series, there was another conference finals tilt with the Knicks that again ended at MSG, but the Pacers headed to the NBA Finals. Where they met the Shaq and Kobe Lakers, who would become the NBA's next and to this day last three-peat winners. The Pacers were overmatched against Shaq just like everyone else that season and lost in six games. And that was that. 
The Pacers had two runs in one, got so close so many times, but had to deal with number 23 when they had their best chance at a title. And they still don't have a title. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.